regard to the, the course knowing and believing absolutely fascinating issues and you're going to be hearing from lots of very provocative speakers and thanks to Barbara Manel who uh, has put together this course uh, as well as today we have the presentation from Professor Yusuf Haddad. Uh, I'll introduce Barbara. Uh, Barbara Menel is the Rothman Chair and Director of the UF Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. She also is a professor of film studies in the Department of English and of German studies in the Department of Languages, Literatures and Culture. Her last book is called Women at Work in the 21st Century European Cinema. She's currently working on two books, one on experimental filmmaker Sue Friedrich and another on the German 1931 film Girls in Uniform, which was one of the first uh, films to deal with lesbian issues. Uh, Barbara, why don't you go ahead and unmute. Okay, well, thank you. And yes, one of those books is finished and the other one, I'm very excited in the middle of it right now. So if anybody has actually seen Girls in Uniform when it came out in the 30s, you know, talk to me because I'm very interested in that. So yes, what we do, and I will say that I started this process with Anne Efros. Um, we are thinking about topics that are related to current events, but then take them away from the immediacy of the current political debate and think more about what are larger contexts that the humanities can add to current discussions. What are deeper ways to think about current issues? And so the current issue that um, Ellen Efros and I had been thinking about was um, facts, non-facts, false, fa false facts, lies that circulate in the public sphere. And so we wanted to think more about how do we decide what we know and how do we decide what we believe and what is the gray zone between knowing and believing. And so I have brought together a group of six scholars uh, from very different fields in the humanities who talk about different aspects that somehow relate to this discussion. And so our first speaker today, Yusuf Haddad, is a linguist on Arabic linguistics, but he will talk about a topic that he developed for an undergrad class about lying. Uh, you know, what are different approaches to when people tell the truth and when they lie? The following speaker is Robert Kawashima, who is in the Department of Religion, and he will talk about the Bible from a scholarly perspective and what we learn from the Bible, what we know and what we believe about the Bible. We then have a philosopher, Christopher Dorst, but Christopher is a philosopher of science. And so it's a humanities approach to science and so he's giving a talk about how to find the difference between science and pseudoscience. The next speaker will be Hina Sheik, and she's a new colleague here in the Center for Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies, and she works on artificial intelligence. So she's going to talk about data, algorithms, and the everyday life. And then we have two more speakers, Pam Gilbert, who is a Victorianist in the English department, who will discuss belief and knowledge during novel challenges, 19th century cholera epidemic. So we're thinking about what did people know about cholera in relationship to what do people know and believe about COVID? And then we end with Anton Matitsin who is a colleague in history and who's talking about skepticism and certainty in the Enlightenment. So it's not all in chronological order, but I hope that these different aspects sort of give you a deep understanding and basis to discuss and background to contemporary discussions about 
lying, knowing, facts, and beliefs. And so I do want to just say that my colleague here today is Professor of Arabic Language and Linguistics, uh, Yusuf Haddad. He's in the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. He's also the coordinator of Arabic and the undergraduate major advisor. And I look forward to his talk. So thank you for coming. One thing that I did is we in the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere have a lot of events. A lot of them are on Zoom. And you can find out by signing up for our email list. And the way to do this, I have dropped into the chat. So if you're interested, please feel free to sign up. And now I give the floor to Yusuf. So thank you for being here. And thank you for Yusuf for volunteering to present today. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thank you, Julianne and Drake, for organizing this as well. And thank you all for coming. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, as Barbara said, I'm a linguist, so I come to you as a linguist who's fascinated with the topic of lying. That's why I designed it course, and I taught it a couple of times to uh, our undergraduate students. And today, I hope to talk to you about lying as a form of communication, maybe highlight some, ask some questions, try to answer them. My hope at the end of the talk is that you leave with more questions that will excite you and maybe try to uh, drive you to look more into the topic and uh, maybe put, put them more in perspective with the following sessions with the, in, in, in this course. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna share with you my screen and take it from there. I hope you can all see this. All right, I'm gonna take this as a yes. So perspectives on lying and uh, here we go. So the, the first thing I would like to discuss with you in, in, uh, today is that, uh, first of all, that we as a society, we appreciate truth and honesty rather than lies. So truth and honesty are normally perceived as, as virtues and we normally brag about them. And even when we consider them as a shortcoming, so let's say you apply for a job as a politician and someone says you are too honest to take this job. Even then, although you did not get the opportunity and it's a shortcoming, it's still perceived as a virtue. You would still leave having not gotten the job, but happy about yourself that you are honest at least, right? Uh, Research actually shows that people may in fact be more honest than you think. So research has shown that for instance, vast majority of people, if they find a wallet on the street and they uh, know who it belongs to, they would immediately run after that person to give them back the wallet. Or if they, there is some form of identification in the wallet, they would try to return it and find, find who the owner is. So the majority of people are honest. And we're gonna try to answer that question. Why is that the case? Uh, lying, on the other hand, has such a bad name. We all lie, every one of us, even if you tell me that you do not lie, you're actually lying about that. Uh, yet, yeah. even, <laughs> even those who brag about lying, right, they do so with the understanding that they are bragging about a bad thing. So let's say you are very good at pulling pranks at friends, or you were very good at lying in order to throw a birthday party, a surprise birthday party to a friend, I would go like, man, you were so good at lying and then it will make me suspicious. What else did you lie to me about, right? So it's, it, it, it really has a bad name. Uh, and, and this seems, there seems to be consensus as a matter of fact, that truth is the best policy. So after all lies have a bad name for a reason. They end relationships, they destroy families, they start conflicts, I mean, uh, Joseph Ellis, a, a journalist in the Chicago Tribune, he, he wrote an article in 2014 entitled American Wars Often Start with a Lie. So we cannot underestimate the power of lies here, right? At the same time, try to imagine a word without lies. In other words, a word where everyone has to tell the truth all the time. I'm going to give you 10 seconds for that. Just imagine a word where you cannot lie. So you will find yourself in a situation like this. You are late, what happened? Nothing, I just really didn't want to come, right? I mean, that, that would be bad. 
This is a scene from uh, a Liar Liar, the movie. And I just want to play it to you. It's, it's a very short 20 second scene. So here we go. Mm, that was incredible. Is it good for you? <laughs> I've had better. <laughs> So here the, the lawyer had a spell by his son, if you will, that he should he would not be able to tell a lie for a whole year. And in fact, he told the lady he was with, I've had better, which no one, I think, in their right mind would do. So if you imagine a word without lies, it becomes an impossible word, right? And the, the nice thing is that a closer look shows that not only lies under certain, not only are lies under certain circumstances necessary, but they are also, or to put it differently, not lying, telling the truth may on occasion be as damaging as telling a lie. In other words, just as lies would end relationships, destroy families, start conflict, so does truth. Truth can end relationships, can destroy families, and can start a conflict. This book uh, by Jamie Turndrop, for instance, she says, kiss your fights goodbye. She talks about honesty as a subtle form of, a, of assault. You, you, can some, you sometimes uh, think that you are being honest when you are being brutally insulted, for instance. And uh, uh, Morris Schweitzer from the University of Pennsylvania says that lying the right way can actually help build connections right, and can build trust in businesses. So let's say you're sharing feedback with a subordinate at work. Uh, honesty is important, but it's easy to say I'm just being honest as an excuse for being mean, right? But br brutal honesty is always not the most effective way to get your message across. So if you start, for instance, your feedback by saying, you know, you had a rocky start, but everyone struggles at the beginning, and then start giving your constructive criticism, you actually can get the message across better. And you, you're not exactly doing that person a favor because at the end of the day, your company, your business may also benefit. So let's call that enlightened self-interest. All right. Uh, so if we all lie, and I'm telling you, on average, research shows that on average, strangers lie to each other three times within the first, the first 10 minutes after they meet. So two strangers meet, within 10 minutes, everyone has told three lies on average, huh? some less, some more, but on average. Then if we all lie, and if lying is necessary, at least sometimes, then it's perhaps worth our time and effort to try and, and understand the nature of this phenomenon better, right? Uh, being a liar and being lied to are fundamental experience of human experience. And uh, if you are, if you love literature like I do, and if you love movies, almost every piece of literature, every movie, if you read Shakespeare for, for God's sake, I mean, you know, Othello, uh, uh, Hamlet, all other plays, they're full of lies, right? The TV series, Mad Men, the movie that I just showed you a clip from Truman Show, uh, or the Truman Show no, is another movie, but they're all full of lies. So then a few questions will follow, right? What is lying? Are humans the only species capable of lying? What makes us so good at lying? And are all lies created equal? And if lies are a necessary and almost inevitable thing, right? What is the best course of action then when it comes to our attitude toward lying? All right, so I'm gonna try to address these questions. I'm not gonna pretend that I'm gonna answer them per se, but I'm gonna try to address them. So let's start with the nature of lying. First of all, lying is a form of communication, right? This definition by, by, uh, by Nap and, and Comedina uh, is quite effective. I mean, one can argue for or against some of the things there, but by and large, it's accurate. It's the conscious alternation of information a person believes to be true in order to significantly change another's perception from what the deceiver thought they would be without alternation. So in other words, if someone consciously alters information that is believed to be true in order to change some other person's perception of that truth, that is a lie, that is the act of lying. And as a form of communication, like all other forms of effective communication, uh, including truth telling, in fact, lying is a cooperative act. When you lie, and when you tell the truth, either way, you're asking yourself, 
out of all I could say, what do I want to say? This is this is the idea, right? If if I want to present myself as more or less of something, if I want to present myself as more liberal, less racist, uh, more uh, I don't know, more of anything or less of anything, what is the best thing to do? What is the best thing thing to say, right? And and lying in that respect, like truth telling, is a cooperative act. It takes two, at least, two or more individuals, right? One of them wants to lie, and the other or the others want to be lied to because there's something in it for them, yeah? Sometimes you hear a partner telling their partner, don't tell me that, lie to me, right? You, you hear it. I mean, some, someone might say even something like this, all right? So that then what follows is then if it is a form of communication, does that mean only humans uh, can lie? Are there other species that can lie? The short answer is that any species with a system of communication is capable of lying. And we are not the only species with a system of communication. So other species are capable of lying. So what is a communication system? So I'm gonna use here Charles Hockett, he's a linguist of early 20th century. I'm gonna use uh, his approach to, or his definition of communication system. Every communication system shares at least three features. One feature is a mode of communication. We as a humans, we're, we're very verbal. So we use the uh, vocal auditory kind of communication system, but this is not the only one. There is the visual, the tactile, the chemical. You can think of different modes of communication. And every communication system has what he calls semanticity. In other words, this means that the signals are not just for nothing, they carry meaning. So if you signal something, if you say a word, that word must have a meaning. If you, if, if you're, when you take your dog for a walk and the dog urinates at certain corners, sending chemical messages to other dogs, saying to other dogs, I've been here, right? And then there is the pragmatic function, which is that uh, this, this system of communication serves a purpose to those that, who are using it. This purpose can vary from enabling survival to influencing the behavior of others. So in this picture here, ants, for instance, use a chemical mode of communication. They secrete something called pheromones. And these pheromones are a chemical message to others to tell them, for instance, that I'm a kin, I'm, I'm not an enemy, or that there is danger somewhere. So there is semanticity and there is a pragmatic purpose, of course, which is survival or reproduction or whatever you want to call it, right? So in this respect, then those ants have a communication system. So does that, what does that mean then? If every spe if any species has a communication system, how, how do they lie? Let's, let's look at an example here, all right? So this is a two minute video that I would like you to watch with me uh, and, and see what's happening here. We're gonna talk about these three features of this communication system when it's done. Pretty fascinating stuff, isn't it? So what happened here is that the squirrels use the chemical mode of communication with the semantic meaning, if you will, a semantic contribution that I'm not a squirrel, I'm a snake like you, and the pragmatic effect is survival. All right, so in a way then, the squirrel did lie. The squirrel said to the snake, I'm not a squirrel, I'm a snake, go away, right? All right, so do you have to be a mammal or a rodent or something like that to lie? No, flowers can lie. So orchids, for instance, depending on where they grow, they tend to look like a certain insect or bug that is dominant in the uh, ecosystem in order to secure pollinization. So for instance, they look here like a, uh, a wasp so that the wasp can come and mate with them. They actually mate with the flower thinking it is another wasp. And by moving from one flower to the other, from one orchid to the other, they end up passing that pollen. So what is it here? It's a visual uh, mode of communication. The semantic meaning is I'm a wasp, I'm not a flower. And the pragmatic effect or purpose is that pollinization, you know, they wanna be reproducing. So it does work. So it doesn't have to be that sophisticated. I mean, you don't have to be a mammal, you can be a plant and you lie viruses 
life. I mean, think of the coronavirus and how it mimics certain things, hides from the immune system and so on and so forth. All right. So how are we humans different or are we, right? To understand how we are different, first we need to understand the different types of deceptions that animals are capable of. So let me give you a very quick overview. In their book here, Lying and Deception, Human Interaction, uh, Mark Knapp and his colleagues recognize different levels, levels of deceptions by, hum, by non-human species. So I'm gonna go over this really quick. You have level one, where you have no behavioral adaptation. It's basically an act of mimicking. So think of the orchid, for instance. It changes its shape to look like a wasp, but it's not like, for instance, it can change into uh, to look like a butterfly. That's it, that's what it is. It looks like a wasp and that's all the time. So an act of mimicry, if you will, all right? Some butterflies that are not poisonous look like butterflies that are poisonous so that birds would not eat them, but they cannot change their shape back and forth. So it's fixed, all right? An act of mimicry, so that's level one. Levels two and three involve some behavioral control by the deceiver. So think of an animal playing dead or think for instance of uh, the, uh, uh, angelfish uh, using that uh, lantern in front of it to lure other fish as if it's a lure and then eat them, right? Uh, they have some control over their behavior, but there is no evidence that they can get into the mind of their enemy or of their prey. All they know is that if I do this, something may come from it, right? Level three is similar but it involves more control. So here, for instance, an animal can control their behavior better. This dog in Thailand, for instance, pretends that it is injured every time it sees someone walking by in order to be petted. So when someone approaches, this, approaches the dog to pet it, it starts jumping around and wanting to play, right? This panda uh, got pregnant once, I think, and got some good things. So afterwards, it started pretending being pregnant like sleeping all day and you're not know, getting, I don't know, there are some behaviors associated with pregnancy in order to get all the good things. And there is a video about it, but I didn't wanna take a lot of time, which is amazing. I mean, they have some control, right? We don't know if they can get into the mind of the people they are deceiving, but at least they know that they are telling something that is not true, right? And then you have level four, which is uh, in, in this case, the deceiver's behavior deliberately deceives. In other words, there is a sense that whoever is lying here knows that the other entity being lied to knows something or does not know something that they do, right? So there is that theory of mind going on and it's more common among non-human primates. And for this, because this is the closest to human uh, uh, lies, I wanna show you another video here, okay? So take a look. In forests from Africa to South America, scientists have found monkeys whose calls refer to predators. But do they ever use sounds for things when they can't see them, when they're just thinking about them? The white-faced capuchins in Costa Rica live by streams full of danger. They're nervous, maybe imagining death lurking under every log or pile of leaves. They too have put sounds to some of their fears and have different calls for different predators. A call goes up, snake. The whole troop leaps out of the water and up into the trees. They soon calm down. Once noticed, most predators are of little danger. The warning system is built on trust and honesty. Yet, very occasionally, some monkeys deliberately shout an alarm call when there is no snake there. The reason for this deception lies in the fact that monkey society is very competitive. The leaders often take food from subordinates. The problem for a low-status monkey is not just finding food, it's hanging on to it, and sometimes they have to be a little crafty. Suppose a subordinate is acting a little strangely, watching the others closely. 
He then could, without any obvious panic, call snake, and everybody leaps out of the water. While the others are looking for snakes, he could sneak down and recover a fallen bird's egg he could have been hiding. The leaders slowly return to the pool. So as you can see, the monkey here has lied. He actually used the sound that signifies that there is a predator, but there was no predator. The min so that's the mode of communication is vocal, right? And the meaning is predator, be careful, but there's no predator. He went down the pragmatic purpose for himself is so that he can be left alone with his food. No one else can take that food from him. So in what respect are we better than those primates, right? And this is the question, right? We're definitely not level one, two, or three, but are we level four or are we better than that? And the answer to that is that human language as a communication system is more sophisticated than what we just saw. And what makes it more sophisticated is two features, its ability for displacement and its ability for productivity. So let me explain these for a second. Displacement refers to the ability to communicate about things that are not present and not now, not here. So spatially and temporally are not here and now. What does that mean? In other words, I can talk about yesterday. A primate cannot talk about yesterday. I can talk about tomorrow. I can talk about uh, North Africa or South America, things that are not here. Primates cannot do that. So this ability of displacement can help me. Actually, it's essential for uh, writing science fiction and imagining the world differently and making it happen, right? So it's quite significant. The other one is productivity. In other words, we don't have a limited number of cries or a limited number of signals. We actually have a limited number of letters in the alphabet and limited number of words in the dictionary, but out of these, we can create an infinite number of expressions and sen sentences talk about things that are otherwise unimagined, they're all new. This is what makes poetry and literature exciting, but this is also what makes lives possible, right? So in that res respect, we are very sophisticated liars. We can even lie by telling the truth. Think about it for a moment. And it allows us to be very, very creative. So someone who's begging, he can say need cash for alcohol, you may not give him, but need act cash for alcohol research makes it more exciting. So you can give them some, <laughs> right? So it's very important for communication, including untruthful communication. So these two features are quite significant, but it's not enough. In addition to these, I need to have a certain level of subjectivity. Subjectivity is defined as consciousness or awareness of my own feelings, my own desires, attitudes, beliefs, and thoughts. I need to know what I know and I need to know what I do not know, right? Even that is not enough. I need to also be able to tap into other people's subjectivity. I need to know how they feel, what they desire, what their attitudes are, what they know and what they do not know. Only then I can lie to them. Why? Because when social actors communicate, they present the world from a specific perspective, every one of them. They engage their subjectivity, in other words, what they think, what they believe, what they desire, with the subjectivity, with the feelings and desires and attitudes of the other interlocutor, of the person they're communicating with. And the purpose is to influence the other person's thoughts, attitudes, and behavior. I'm trying to change your thoughts and attitudes and behavior toward lies now as we speak. So language plus intersubjectivity results in the ability to perspectivize. I can perspectivize the word to you. I can make you see the word differently if I'm skilled enough with my language and I am capable of knowing what you think and believe. Politicians are very good at that. So language plus intersubjectivity allows us, or allows, this combination allows us to be lying experts. 
This is what makes us different from other species in terms of lying. Some animals do show a level of intersubjectivity, especially like cats and dogs, if you have any primates, but we are par excellence the best at that. At least as far as we know, I'm biased, you know, because I'm human. So language allows me to talk about things that are not here and not now. This includes poetry, novels, jokes, and of course, lies. Intersubjectivity allows me to know what you know and what you do not know, and only then I can intentionally lie to you. If I do not know what you know, I cannot lie to you. Now, of course, the question that follows is, are all lies created equal? And I think you know intuitively that no, they aren't. There are some lies that are okay, some that aren't, right? So in practice, lies are defined in context of communication. So Knapp and his colleagues maintain that context is based on perception of a number of features. So you have three features here that I wanna highlight, awareness and intent, situation and effects and consequences. Remember these are not, uh, these do not apply to all cultures equally. Some cultures would look at these differently. For instance, in Western culture, intent is more Im important than consequence. In East Asian culture, consequence is more important than intent. So here, if I try to lie to you, even if I'm not successful, if you can actually prove that I intended to lie to you, I'm in trouble. In East Asia, the tendency is that if I did not succeed, it's no problem. Right? And again, I'm, I'm not trying to essentialize the cultures. I'm trying to talk about tendencies. Okay. All right. So let's start with the perception of awareness and intent. So the first question is, was the act performed consciously with the intention to mislead? Right? Most lying is believed to be done while the liar really means to lie. If someone lies to you, but they did not have the intention to lie. In other words, they did not know that it was a lie. You don't say they were lying. They were just say they were misinformed, right? If me, people make an honest, careless mistake, you just say they were misinformed. Now, notice that issue of intent is quite significant. Uh, think of a situation where you are a boss and those who are subordinate to you are gonna have some, meet, some meeting that is legally questionable. You tell them, I don't wanna know about it because by not knowing about it, you can deny intention. In other words, you don't know, you don't wanna know. Think of situations where a lawyer, for instance, talking to two criminals, he's representing or she's representing, and then the two criminals wanna talk about something that the lawyer shouldn't know about the lawyer would step away, would, would just step aside and let them talk because she or he shouldn't be knowing this. So this idea of intent and, and by not knowing, then later they cannot intentionally lie because really they do not know. However, they meant not to know, all right? So this intention is quite significant, especially in Western culture. Perception of situation. Situation is quite significant too. Some situations make lying more likely, right? And in some cases, lying becomes celebrated. So think for instance of espionage and war. You expect people to lie. Politeness rituals. You expect people to lie. In games like poker, for instance, same. In magic shows, same. We celebrate lying. There is an international spy museum in DC. This is a celebration of lying as a career. So the situation is very important. If someone comes knocking on your door and you're hiding uh, two innocent victims, this happens during the uh, Nazi Germany, for instance. If you have uh, a couple of people who are Jewish hiding in your room and someone comes to kill them, Will you tell them they are there just so that you wouldn't lie? No, you would lie. You should lie to protect them. So situation is key. And consequence is also important, right? So we may consider who was affected in what ways, right? So sometimes you feel that some people uh, deserve to be lied to. So of course your decision, right? 
some others no. So lies to achieve goals may be self-serving, right? Or may serve others. If they are self-serving, they are worse than serving others. So think of the Boeing uh, disaster that happened a couple, a few years ago when two planes went down and the CEO actually lied. You may think of the lie as self-serving, but you may also think of the lie as serving his company. Those who thought of the lie as serving his company were not as hard on the CEO as those who thought that he was lying to serve himself. Right? Again, benefiting someone other than the liar or having positive consequences. If your lie has positive consequences, it is also mitigated. The severity of sanctions is mitigated. All right? Uh, the severity of sanctions for lying can also be mitigated if perceived as having both the lie and its consequences acknowledged by the liar. Think of the court of law when someone admits and show some regret, some remorse, they, are, they usually receive a milder sentence. A few years ago, I don't know if you remember this story, there were several coaches in different universities who admitted students because they thought they weren't athletes, the students weren't athletes, but they helped them with the admission, pretending they were athletes to get some, and they got some money in return. So this guy here, a sailing uh, coach in Stanford, he got a sentence of one day in prison, one day. And the reason one is because he admitted the lie. Two, he showed remorse. And three, he said that the money he got was to buy new boats for the team. He didn't pocket the money. And all of these reasons made the sentence absolutely mild. I mean, it's nothing. One day, I could be in jail one day just because I'm here now. And this guy got only one day. And he admitted people who were not sailing athletes in any form or shape. Others that were not as lucky because, well, they were more self-serving in that life. He wasn't. Okay. And uh, we also take into account if the lie has trivial rather than significant repercussions, of course. And finally, long and short-term effects. All of these are taken into account. Okay, and here's one more. All right, so now the question is, why don't we lie more often? I mean, if lying is everywhere, it is part of our experience, why don't we lie more often? So there are a few reasons for that. First of all, for lying to be considered as lying, we have to be, and to be effective, we have to be living in a world where truth is actually valued. In other words, if everyone lies, there's no value for the lie because everyone lies. If I lie to you all the time, nothing I say will matter. But if I tell you the truth all the time, except that one time when I lie to you, then my lie is effective. Think of Machiavelli's advice to the prince. Machiavelli's advice to the prince was that you should appear truthful and you should tell the truth when you can, so that when you lie, you are believed. So this is the first reason. That's one reason why we don't lie all the time. Second reason, as a species, we humans were not the strongest. One individual from another species huh, can basically have us for dinner. So how did we survive? A social system based on trust, honesty, reliability, and mutual aid was essential for our survival. It's called reciprocal altruism. It is still essential for our survival as a species today. And the third reason why we don't lie very much is because, and, and bear with me here for a moment. If we are a small society, you don't need to have honesty as a policy. If you lie, you will be caught in about 10 seconds because policing is easy. Everyone knows everyone. There is more certainty and less reliance on just faith that things are okay. Okay, I'm gonna show you something here from Fiddler on the Roof. One second. So Fiddler on the Roof. Right? In the circle of our little village, 
We've always had our special types. For instance, uh, Yenter the matchmaker. For your girl. <laughs> <Remnachum> the beggar. <laughs> and most important of all, our beloved rabbi. So as you see, in a small village, everyone knows everyone. But, and if everyone knows everyone in a small village, that means if someone lies, they are immediately caught. And this is what happens in Fiddler on the Roof. So if you look, for instance, uh, here. And among ourselves, we always get along perfectly well. Of course, there was the time when he sold him a horse and told him it was only six years old when it was really 12. So he knows that someone sold someone a horse, told them it's six years old and it's only, it was actually 12. He immediately got caught, right? But as community grows larger, it relies more on faith, right? That, so the faith that one is informed is what one is informed is actually true, whether it's about economy, politics, etc., right? In complex societies, Factors that affect one's life and the life of the group are more interconnected and interdependent. And this, this makes lies more devastating. And this is why people don't lie as often because actually truth is the best policy in that respect. So moving forward, what is the best course of action when it comes to our attitude toward lying? I'm gonna wrap up here with a couple of pieces of advice based on literature and on, on uh, experience. We should live our social life with the expectation that people will not lie, that they will tell the truth to the best of their ability. Keeping in mind that the possibility of lies or not the whole truth, right? And deception may occur. We must engage in a continuous evaluation of truths and lies and whether these are good and bad. Not all truth is good and not all lies are bad. It depends on the nature of the truth, nature of the lie and on the context. If a person cheats on their spouse and they go and tell them because they wanna be truthful, this is one thing. They wanna tell them because they believe that will lead the partner to initiate a divorce, that's another story. It becomes self-serving. So truth, is it always good? Is it always bad? The most damaging kind of lies tend to be those that promote your own self-interest at the expense of others. And lies that are more, most beneficial are those that are not selfish, right? And in the process of evaluation, make sure that you do not lie to yourself about your intentions. So, you know, people tend to say, I lied because I wanna protect my partner's feeling because I didn't wanna harm this and that person. You wanna make sure you know what your intentions are. Are you lying to serve yourself or because you are really having the best interest of the target of the lie in mind? So if you tell your partner that she or he looks great before a date to boost their self-esteem, that's one thing, but saying that to get your loved one out of the door because you're late, that's a completely different story. Keeping in mind that bad intentions may be part of truth telling as well, all right? And with this, I wrap up, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Haddad. Absolutely. We're ready, we're ready for uh, questions, answers, uh, comments online or uh, in the audience. Okay, see we have hand raised. I go to Len, go ahead. Uh, excellent presentation, thank you so much. I, I just had one question, I think about the uh, idea, I think you mentioned at the outset about um, lying, humans lying is cooperative, a cooperative interaction. And I was thinking about whether that's the case in certain circumstances, such as if you have uh, somebody who is predatory, like a psychopath, I, it's hard to see how they're really 
concerned at all about uh, the other person's uh, um, input. And they're not really working with another person in a cooperative way. They're working in a predatory way. Antisocial people, you know, with antisocial personalities would also be fitting into that mold where they're lying for their own purposes, but really aren't thinking. They don't have a lot of empathy. They're not thinking about the other person's uh, feelings or thoughts so much as getting what they want sometimes. Right. So there, there are, may, yes, can I answer? Sure. sure. Yeah. So there are there are two two parts to this question, right? So the first part is when I say it's a cooperative act, I don't mean that the two per the two people actually are working in in each other's with with each other's interest in mind. I mean that the person who is lying, the person who's lying has has a something in it, but the person who's being lied to is cooperating in the sense that maybe they're not questioning more. Maybe they're not digging more. Maybe they're not saying, let me not decide now. Let me look into it because they want to be out the door now. They want that in that respect, it's cooperative, right? Not because they are cooperating. In other words, have the same goal in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if I'm trying to buy a car and the seller tells me, but I'm desperate and, and the person selling me the car says, oh, it's in perfect condition and I take their word for it, although I have feeling in my stomach that maybe I should look for the car facts. Yeah, I cannot just leave and say, okay, he lied to me and I was duped, but that's because he's, he's a great liar. But I also accepted to believe that person's lie. In oh, that sorry. sense, it's cooperative. Now you raised another issue here. More than 95% of the population uh, lie a little bit. And most of the lies are pro-social and most of the lies are harmless and mainly are to save face and to keep the conversation going. Uh, sometimes you lie because you don't want a, a, a lie to get in the way of a good story. You wanna exaggerate a little bit. There is a small portion of the society. You refer to them as psychopaths, sociopaths or those with antisocial personality disorders. These are what referred to in the literature as professional liars. And these are liars who lie all the time. And in that respect, they become pathological. And when they are pathological, it stops and it's always Machiavellian. In other words, they would lie to you and tell you anything you wanna hear as long as they can get something from you. And once you are not useful to them anymore, they just throw you aside. And these are the most harmful type of liar in society. Mm -hmm. And some of them have lies that extend over a long, long, long period of time, right? A mother who lied mm -hmm. that her child, for instance, was disabled when she wasn't disabled for years and got a house built for her and got a lot of money. And finally, that woman did get killed by her own daughter and her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. uh, th these types of lies are what we call these liars are professional liars, and that's different. That that requires more than just a cooperative act. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Larry, go ahead. <clears throat> I'm gonna suggest it might add to your presentation if you introduce terms to distinguish between lies using white lies versus black lies, and also use the word fibs, which are very common. Right, so there are all of these terms, right? And uh, uh, so white lies is what I refer to here as pro-social lies. And the black lies are what uh, you, you may label as self-serving uh, lies. And there are also, a, there is a category of research that is called lies and its kins. So uh, take for instance, and these are used in scientific terms, so excuse my French here. If, uh, is bullshitting a form of lie, right? And these are terms that are actually, and there are other terms, right? Uh, gaslighting, for instance, are these a form of lying? This, so bullshitting is a form of lie when the liar who's lying to you knows that you know that he or she is lying to you, right? So these are different. So there is a whole category and I cannot pretend that I covered uh, nearly any of them here today. Thank you. 
We have an online question from Joe Burko. Is disinformation a special type of lying? What is the purpose of this term? Uh, disinformation, it is, it, I don't want to consider it a special type of lying. I think it is special in the sense that it's more used in media outlets. So in that respect, it covers a certain category of communication. So on social media or news outlets. And uh, those terms to me, disinformation or alternative truth or alternative facts or something like that, uh, these are, in my mind, euphemisms. So you don't want to tell someone that they are a liar. You say that they are presenting this information. So because calling someone a liar is more of a label. But if you're saying you're presenting this information, it becomes a one-time incident. Uh, so uh, it's, it's part of not rocking the boat too much when you accuse someone of something. Thank you. Uh, David, go ahead. As an aside, it is said that when General Douglas MacArthur first learned of the death of President Roosevelt, he said there was a man who never told the truth when a lie would do. <laughs> I, I didn't catch the beginning, but I think I caught the, the end. Yeah, I, I, th that was a comment, right? Not a question. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. Other comments or questions? Barry, go ahead. Uh, hi, Yusuf. It's Barry. Yeah. Um, what about the uh, person who lies all the time? I think there's a term for it, psychological, you know, constant lying. How does that fit into your schema? Hi, Mary. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so these are what I referred to earlier here as pathological liars, and those Although this is not, by the way, a well-defined term. The thing about people who lie all the time is that it all, this act of lying always follows from another type of disorder, of a personality disorder. So if someone suffers from a narcissistic personality disorder or is a psychopath or sociopath, right? Then lying becomes a means to an end because when they lie, they can fulfill the desires that they have as a result of that disorder. So one should dig a little bit deeper into the uh, reasons behind the lies. But again, these are a very small percentage of people. Thank you. Uh, other comments online or uh, in the audience? Go ahead. Sometimes it appears that there are people who want to be lied to, whether seeking affirmation of their own beliefs. Uh, what do you have to say about that? So this is the actual uh, case of the cooperative, uh, of lying as a cooperative act. This, this is something where you want to tell someone the truth, but they are not, they are not ready to handle the truth, as the famous quote goes and they want to be lied to uh, because it is more reassuring and it keeps them in their comfort zone. So think for instance of a uh, spouse who does not want to end a relationship because either they love their partner so much or because it's a safe zone for them. So they do not want to learn about the deception that the partner has been uh, uh, or all the lies that the partner has been uh, uh, telling them. They don't want to know the truth because that secures that they stay in the relationship and they stay in their comfort zone, right? They know deep down that they are lying, that they are being lied to, but the payoff, the reward is that they can stay in their comfort zone. Self-deception actually sometimes work like that too. One lies to themselves uh, because it keeps them, it gives them more self-confidence. It keeps them more reassured uh you can lie to yourself that it wasn't your fault when in fact it was and so on a little bit of self-deception can be healthy but when it goes to an extreme then it becomes very harmful so yeah any other questions okay well thank you so much professor Haddad. 
and let's all give our honest round of appreciation to him. Thank you. Thank you all. It was a pleasure to be here. Absolutely fascinating.